And on Sunday evenings, we are obviously going through our uh, series on the subject of obeying authority, obeying authority. When we begin every single series, I want you to keep in mind part one. And the title was The Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. Now in this world there are lords. There are kings. There are rulers that are going to be in places of authority. And a lot of them are legitimate in this world. God has even ordained them. And we're going to look at some of those tonight. But we also know, we also have to keep in mind that there is a Lord over those lords and there is a ruler over those rulers and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is God. He is the authority above all. And there's a totem pole. And when we start a series, whether it be, you know, the subject of husbands, whether it be the subject of, you know, church rulership, whether it be the subject of societal government, we always need to understand and keep in mind that there is a government or an authority or a power above that government government or that authority or that power. Now tonight in part number two, we are going to be looking at societal governments, societal governments, and this can also be referred to as political governments or human governments. We'll often refer to it probably more so as political governments, and the reason being, you know, the word uh, uh, politics actually comes from a word that means city, and we can even see this in the, in, the, in the English language with the word metropolitan. What does metropolitan refer to? It refers to city. That's actually what it means. The, the, the the root of that word being politan is politics. It comes from a Greek word that meant city or civilization. And what politics are is the way that society works together. You know, when you talk about you know something being political, it's the way that people are you know working out deals with one another. It's the way that society works together with one another. And in the sense of politics or societal politics and governmental politics, it's referring to the rules that are set that govern society. So this evening we're going to be looking at human government, more specifically societal government. I want you to look with me here at Romans chapter number 13, verse number 1. Romans chapter number 13, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, I pointed this out last week. I want you to notice that it's not just one power. It's not just the power of God, that God's authority and God's power is the only power or the only rulership. It says the powers that be. So right there we can see that there are multiple powers. There are other systems of govern, government. I want you to look at with me at verse number 2 now. Verse number 2, the Bible says... Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. Now, ordinance there is referring to the fact that God has ordained or God has anointed or appointed this particular power to rule. He gave this power. It's referring to the institution of government. It goes on to say this, And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So there again in verse number one, verse number two, we can see that totem pole being reestablished. We see God at the top and then he discusses that there are powers underneath that God has ordained. One other thing that I want to point out because there are a lot of people, even you know, uh, Christians, even fundamental Christians that are opposed to any sort of human government or any sort of societal government. That is not biblical and that is not scriptural even slightly. That is severely erroneous from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. There are many, many scriptures that cause that to just fall flat on its face. There are a lot of people that would be tied with the same sort of philosophy that we have. Even, you know what, even still a lot of people may uh, politically uh, describe themselves here today as being somewhat of a libertarian. And sometimes libertarians can lean towards, you know, an anarchy type of system of government. That is not what the Bible teaches at all. The Bible is totally against any sort of, you know, anarchist type of philosophy or attitude. The Bible teaches that there are powers, that there is a government, and that we are to be subject to those higher powers and to that 
government. The reason why people fall into that is because of pride. And when you meet these people and you talk to these people who have this type of anarchy system that they want to set up and that they believe in, you can always see it's because of pride. And that's the reason. They don't want to be subject. It's the same types of people that often have trouble in other areas of life. Like obeying their boss at work. Like obeying maybe the pastor while they're at church. Like obeying any sort of government in any other area that they may have. It's because they have an issue with pride. That's the whole reason why. And ultimately, I'm sure in their own personal lives, they struggle with obeying God as well because it's just an issue with a lack of humility. So there are governments and societal government, human government reigning over civilizations is biblical. And we as Christians should not be opposed to this. But there are all different types of models that people will have, even independent Baptists will fall on the spectrum sometimes over here or over here. But our views on government, just like our views on any doctrine or anything that we believe, need to come from this book. Whatever we believe about any sort of you know, uh, system in any area of life, whatever that belief is, it needs to be derived from the Bible. Otherwise, you're just leaning upon your own understanding. It's just something that you've dreamt up in your own mind. Romans chapter number 13 really gives us uh, a lot to understand about the purpose of government. That's one of, the one, one of the things that I want to focus on right now is the purpose of government. What's the reason for government? Look with me at verse number 3. The Bible says this, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good... And thou shalt have praise of the same. Now, of course, this is talking about the powers of government. And I want you to notice that it tells you in the very beginning for rulers. These would be the rulers, the, the men that are the rulers over these governments. It says this, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Now, one thing before we go any further and I actually start expositing what this verse in particular is teaching, I want you to understand that he's not talking about a specific type of government or a specific government uh, that is on the earth at that time or even a specific government that we have today. He's not talking about the Chinese government. He's not talking about the United States government or specifically a democracy or anything of that sort. He's just talking very, very general, extremely general just about there being rulers and about there being a government. And then he is saying that governments have rulers and the purpose of those governments is to have rulers and to do what? To punish evildoers, right? They, their job is to punish evildoers. It says, for rulers are not a terror to good works. So they're not, they're, their job is not to make people that do good things afraid. They don't scare people that are doing good things. This is just in general, just governments in general, right? Then it goes on to say, but to the evil. So the man that should be afraid of just government in general you know, and, and let's say a utopian government, right? The right type of government. And I'm not talking in a communistic type of way. Just the right government is what I'm saying when I say utopian there. It would be the man that is afraid. It, the man that would be afraid of government would be the man that's doing evil, right? Couldn't we speak in just general terms and that would make perfect sense to everyone? Well, that's what the Bible is doing here. Then it goes on to say this. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? So he's telling them, you shouldn't be afraid of governments if you're not doing anything wrong. That's what his point is. Now, is that true in all cases? In every single case? He's speaking general here, but is that true in, uh, from every single government? Now, in the sense of this, think about this. Daniel, when he was told not to pray, I mean, from this perspective, would he have had a reason to fear that government at that time? Or let's say that a government told you, hey, you're not allowed to have your Bible. Is it a good work to keep your Bible according to the Word of God? Of course. Now, in that case, would it be a little bit you know, terrifying if you had a government that, 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 that was that tyrannical and had their morals so screwed up? Of course. So you see how you have to apply this just in general. You have to think of this just in general about <clears throat> the institution of government and how government is meant to be, right? Look further. It says this. Wilt thou uh, then not be afraid of the power? And then it says, where am I at? I lost my spot. Uh, Do that which is good... And thou shalt have praise of the same. Verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. 
Now again, this is talking about government, right? Just government in general. The job of the ruler is to be the minister of God. The job of the ruler is to carry out you know, uh, 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 that which is good, isn't it? It's to enforce laws and rules that should reflect morality, right? It's, it's to punish what? A thief. Do you understand what I'm saying? So his job or to punish a murderer. So in that case, if he was punishing a murderer and the murderer received the death penalty, what is God's judgment for a murderer to receive? The death penalty. So what would take place there? He would be the minister for God in that situation, wouldn't he? So you can see what this is teaching here is that the job in general of government, God wanted there to be government. In the very, very beginning, God established laws and rules in virtually every different uh, uh, type of society that existed. All the way back with Adam and Eve and Cain and all of them. You know, he gave rules and things. And there was to be rulers and people that would punish them for these things, right? And if a person would murder someone, they were to receive a punishment. They were to be murdered, right? If they, and that was given to Noah when they got off the ark. And what would that person be? The minister of God. Because he's carrying out God's work. That's why a minister is someone that does work. It goes on to say this, But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, there's a couple of uh, points that I want to make. Now, as I say, have I, I, I've mentioned these already, but real quick, a very simplistic answer of the purpose of government, this is an extremely simplistic answer, is to punish evildoers, is to punish evildoers. Now, a pretext to that would be that they would be establishing laws as well. They would need to establish laws. Now, in order for them to punish people for breaking laws, obviously they would have to put the laws into place. They would have to institute the laws. So, a very, very simple way of wording this would be that they would be the establisher of laws and then the, the punisher of them that break such laws. Now, many people have all different types of what government should do. There are all different uh, views and theories and models of how government should behave. Some people believe that government should, you know, support you and take care of you, you know, from cradle to grave, as, you, as you've heard the statement, right? From the beginning of their, your life to the end of your life, in every, in every aspect of your life. There are some people out there that believe that government should be providing you every, you know, uh, health service that you would ever desire and ever need, right? They believe that any sickness, anything that you would need, that the government should be there. And they, they say that, you know, that these things are, are, are things that you deserve. These are rights, is what they say, right? It's a right. You have a right to that, right? And those same people would probably, uh, or you, I'm sure that they would be, they would uh, also agree that in this, their same model of government that you should be supported by food, that the, that the government should, uh, you know, be the one that, that supplies your food. You know, when you get into that, obviously, the government's then going to ultimately be the one that decides your diet as well, right? And so they're going to be deciding your diet. They're going to be issuing you your rations, right? Your, the amount of food that you're going to have for the week and what foods you should be eating. And they're obviously deciding all of these things. You know, some of the other things would be that uh, they would be in charge of your safety. So they would be making sure that you are safe. And we're getting to a lot of these things already in our life today, you know, as I speak. Uh, you know, they would be in charge of your safety. A lot of people believe that the government's responsibility is to keep you safe. It's to make sure that you're safe in every area of your life, right? And that's the reason why a lot of the laws that are passed in our uh, 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 nation today, in our country today, they're not only to punish evildoers, are they? Supposedly, they are to keep you safe. That's because government today, this is not only just models of what some people think, our government today believes that it is their responsibility to keep you safe in your life. And not just in the area from evildoers. So let me specify that. In all areas of life. They, need, they, they believe that they need to keep you safe from yourself as well. Um, government in some systems, you know, more, more extreme than that, you know, uh, even, uh, would, you know, uh, this would be socialistic and, and, and communism, of course. They would believe that they should be distributing, they should be receiving and distributing all wealth. And this happen, has happened and does happen in countries today where every bit of money that is earned through labor is just basically the government's. And then the government issues the money back out as it sees fit. How much money? Not only that, in some societies, people believe in the government believes that it should decide, and it does, 
what job and what career that you should even have uh, in your life. They would put you into whatever position that they would want. They would even be in charge of your lodging, of you know, where you live and your house. They would pay for it. Obviously, everybody lives in a cookie-cutter hut time home at that point, right? And then what they're doing on top of that is they would be the one that would be maintaining it. And obviously things would come with that where you're not allowed to paint it, you're not allowed to do anything to it, you just have to trust the government for everything. There are areas where these types of, of systems exist and have existed in the past. And that's where people think that there is no limitations to government. That government is the answer for everything. Now, biblically speaking, that is extremely far off. That is not a biblical view even slightly. The Bible's view of government is extremely limited. And a Christian, a Christian's view on government should reflect what is taught from Scripture, and that is that we should believe in a limited government. And again, what is the purpose or what is the area of government? It should be to punish evil doers. That is the purpose of government and that is really truly the only purpose of government. It should be to punish evil doers. Now, <clears throat> Uh, furthermore, if we look at what are the purposes of rules and what are the rules, because like I said, if, if they're going to be, if these are going to be rulers that are that their job is to punish evil doers, obviously they're going to be the one that's laying out the rules, right? They're going to be the ones that are deciding the rules or deciding what the laws are and what are the purpose of laws or what are the purposes of rules? And they are to keep order. They are to keep order. Now, I, I mentioned last week in the sermon, and you know, because they're philosophically related, both systems are. We're discussing how we should respond in the purposes of government. I said that the reason, the 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 result of obeying God would be what in your life? It would be great order. Well, the purpose that you know, even societal governments give laws and give rules is that they want what? They want to try to keep order. They want to try to have peace. So that is the reason why and, the, and, and should be the purpose of government is to give rules or to give laws that keep order. And then they would be responsible for enforcing those laws and enforcing those rules. Now if we look at the Old Testament, you know, we have the book of the law. We have uh, you know, many, many different commandments that God gave to a society, which would be the nation of Israel, right? And when He gave these commandments to the nation of Israel, the purpose was for what? It was to keep order. When you look at, you see Exodus chapter number 20, which is the Ten Commandments, these are obviously highly moral, aren't they? You, know, you can see that He's focusing on all the things of relationship, uh, of sinning between God and between God and man, and then also between man and man. These would be you know, moral transgressions, and obviously the, you know, uh, the, the rest of the law as well. When you get into Exodus chapter number 21, though, you'll notice that it's not just dealing specifically with things that are you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we would consider, you, know, I mean, you would definitely still say that they're moral, but there's a lot of things in that are just like, hey, this is how you, you, know, this is how you deal with this type of situation. And the purpose is, to have society to run smoothly. The, the purpose is to have society to run you know, smoothly in, in all areas of transactions with money and all different types of things, of how you're to board up holes that you do. And it's to keep order and it's to keep peace. Now in you know, the book of Exodus, a lot of the commandments and a lot of the laws that are given uh, there, you know, all of them virtually. Let me say this: all of them. There are uh, punishment, different varying punishments, right? There's a big list of punishments that, that would be, you know, considered harsh today, uh, or, or crimes that are punished with the death penalty. That would be crimes that are punished with the death penalty, right? Now, what's the purpose of the death penalty? What would be the reason of the death penalty? Is it to reform someone? It's to get them out of the way, isn't it? It's to remove this person from civilization or to remove them from society. Why? Because they are causing disorder. That's the reason. Because they are bringing about disorder in the society. They are a menace to society. The job of government is to keep order. The job of government is to make sure that they maintain order. And how do they do so? They do so by establishing laws. And these are not just laws in every area of life. These are laws particularly that keep society running. That's all that it is. Now, 
what does it mean to, this is very, very important. What does it mean when we say that, uh, you know, that we're trying to keep peace in society? Well, you know, in your own personal life, you're going to make bad decisions, right? But does every bad decision you make affect other people, every single one, in a way in which you are, you know, hurting them in society? Right? It doesn't, does it? Now, you know, if you as a single guy decided to just lay at home and be a drunkard, right? Is that a sin against God? It is, isn't it? You know, you're commanded, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, right? That is a, a sin against God. But can you point me to a commandment in the Old Testament where God says that you're going to be punished for drinking alcohol? You cannot. Do you know why? Do you, you know the reason why? Because you're not harming anyone else by doing that, ultimately. Now, if you got drunk and then went out and harmed someone and actually did hurt them, there are different laws for that and you would have to pay them back for that. But that's something that would be, that, that you personally would be sinning against God. It's not necessarily in and of itself causing disorder in society. Now, could it? Yes, it could. And once it gets to that point, we don't preemptively punish people. Once it gets to that point, then that person would, you know, once they harm someone, once they killed someone, once they did whatever it may be that harmed another person, another person or his property, well then they would have to pay for that. So the point is that the purpose of rulers and the purpose of government is to maintain order in society. It's not to maintain order in your own personal life. It's not to make sure that you're doing every single thing right in your life and that your life is perfect with, between you and God, right? That's not the purpose. The purpose is to, to maintain order within society. And that's actually the same philosophy that the United States of America had when our country was founded was that when someone is to be punished and when someone has broken a civil law is when they, has, they have harmed another person and, you know, there's... Of course, the, the, in, the, in the, uh, the Constitution, that every man has you know, uh, his, his God-given rights to, you know, his, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it goes on to explain that if one person, whoever it may be, harms another person's life, liberty, or their pursuit to happiness, that person needs to be punished. And it even goes so far as to say that even if government, that's, I don't know if you've ever listened to the Constitution before, but that's actually what it says in the Constitution. Even, even if, you know, it's not only a person alone, but government itself does this, then such government needs to be, I don't remember exactly how it's worded, you know, uh, moved out of the way or replaced or something like that. So you know when someone needs to be punished by government is when they are harming another person or they are harming or being a menace to society. They're doing evil to someone else. I want you to look back at Romans chapter number 13 and I'm going to show you that the death penalty was not only biblical in the Old Testament, it's still also biblical today. Look with me at verse number 4. The Bible says, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. And then it says this, For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So what is he bearing? He's bearing the sword. Now he doesn't, you know, he's not going around and just scaring people with it or tickling people with it. The purpose of a sword isn't just to cut somebody's, you know, arm off. It's referring to capital punishment. That's the purpose of the sword. It's obviously something that is used, you know, to fatally wound someone, to fatally harm a person. It's referring to capital punishment. And the Bible in the Old Testament teaches capital punishment for multiple crimes, adultery, you know, kidnapping, uh, you know, rape, homosexuality. There's multiple things that the Bible in the Old Testament teaches the death penalty for. And here in the New Testament, in the most prominent passage that speaks of government and the purpose of government, it talks about the ruler who's there to punish evil works and it says that he bears a sword. A sword is used to kill. That is the purpose of a sword. It is referring to the fact that they capital punishment is something that the uh, government's job is to be. That's what that's referring to. Look at verse number 5. It says this, Wherefore ye must needs be subject. Now notice that. To what? That's to government. We, there is a subjection to government. There is a subjection for us you know, as a responsibility to God, to government. And I'll show you that. Look at this further. It says this, Not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. And what that means is not only because you're, you're scared of their wrath, not only because you know, 
Because if you look at the end of verse number four, it, you know, it said this, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Not just because you're scared of that wrath, not just because you don't want to die, but then he says this, but also for conscience sake. So that's for your own conscience to what? Conscience toward God. That's what that's referring to. That's referring to the fact that it is also right for us to be subject to government in order to be right with God. God. So if we are to just you know, be uh, just a complete rebel and obey nothing that government has for us, we would not be right with God. And the types of people that just want to be you know, just an anarchist and just, just rebel against every government and you know, government shouldn't reign over any area of my life and all of this, they're not right with God. That's what the Bible teaches. They, they, you know, their, their, their conscience should be and, and would be bothering them. Uh, I want you to look at the very next verse. Look at verse number 6. It says this. It ties in with verse number 5. It says, For, that means like, of course because, For, for this cause pay ye tribute also. And then it tells us a little bit more about that. And this is very important. It says this. For, that's of course again because, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Now, you know, a lot of people will argue about whether or not, you know, uh, any sort of, it, whether, let me just say this, whether taxation is theft or any sort of taxation is theft or all of those different subjects. And let me say this, there is a legitimate type of taxation even. There is a type of taxation that God establishes. So before we even look at what this is saying here, I want you to think about the Old Testament. Who, who was the, the rulers and the governors in the Old Testament? It would be the priests, wouldn't it? They were the judges. They were the ones that carried out the law. And do you know what everyone paid to them? The tithe. You know what the purpose of that was? It's because that they were, I want you to look at verse number 6, attending continually upon this very thing. You know what that means? That was their full-time job. You know what they were? They were, look at what it says right before that, God's ministers. So I want you to you know, put those two together, plug those two together, and kind of wrap your mind around that for a few minutes. It's the same purpose. It's the exact same thing going on. They were there for a couple of reasons, obviously for spiritual purposes to help and guide the people, but they were also there as the government. They were also there to enforce rules and, and enforce specifically God's law. They were the ones that taught the people the law, and they were the ones that helped, helped uh, uh, you know, others in, in different parts of the city to enforce the law. That's why when... They had the cities of refuge, and one, may, you know, one might have accidentally murdered someone. Where would they go to seek that refuge? And where was the city of refuge located? It was where the priests were. Why? Because they were the rulers. They were the judges, and they would be the one that would decide that. So you know what they received? It was a tax. That's what they received. The 10% was basically a tax on the people that was being paid for a couple of reasons. Obviously, it, it served multiple purposes. It was for the sacrifices also. It fed... The priests were told that in 1 Corinthians. And do you know why? Because they, they continually attended upon this very thing. Because this was their job all of the time. So is there a legitimate tax that should be paid to government according to this? Paul, whether you like it or not, Paul is justifying that there is a time to pay this tax. And it's two rulers. Now, everyone here would agree that there should be rulers punishing people in society, right? Yeah. So is this going to be their full-time job? You expect them not to get paid? Of course, how are they going to get paid? By our taxes, by us paying them. Now, this does not take a logical leap that my taxes should support welfare and that my taxes should support food stamps and that my taxes should support WIC and all of these other things, right? We don't logically leap and jump all of that. That my taxes should pay for somebody's insurance or for whatever it may be, you know, for health insurance and all of these things. No, this is teaching that there is a justified tax to those that continue, you know, uh, uh, daily in this very thing. Attend continually in this very thing is how it's worded, right? That is a justified tax. I'm, I would consider myself a very strong libertarian. You know, I've studied, you know, politics and things like that, social economics, and I believe that I fall into the category of libertarianism. I'm far from being a neocon and things like that. I believe in an extremely limited, limited government. The government I believe in is what you see right here in Romans 13. I believe that there should be people executing judgment. But here's the thing. They're not going to do that for free. They're going to need to you know, be... You know, it's the same sense of pastors. If you want them to work daily and the deacons that started doing the daily ministration, 
They're going to be paid. Why? Because they attend continually upon this very thing. Yes. So that means that the rulers who are attending continually upon this very thing should be paid. Right? So I would say this, any other form of taxation is theft. That's what I would say. Because here's the thing, I start with the Bible. I don't start with libertarianism. That's not my philosophy. Amen. The Bible's my philosophy and I look at everything else through that lens. So the Bible teaches that this is a justified form of taxes. But even still, there's another point that we need to make as Christians, we need to understand. Even still, if we are charged other taxes, just because they are not justified does not mean that we should not pay those taxes. The Bible also teaches that if we are charged other tributes or other taxes, that we should just pay to whatever they charge us. That's what we should do because we have bigger fish to fry. I'm going to show you that right now. I want you to look here at uh, verse number 7. He says this, Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. So no, I want you to notice it says, Render therefore, it says this, to all their dues. Does that say some of them or certain types? It says all, doesn't it? All their dues. Render therefore to all their dues. So it's just saying, pay all their dues. Render therefore to all their dues. I want you to go with me to Matthew. I think uh, 17 was the first one that I had here. Matthew, yeah, Matthew 17. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 17. I'll have you turn with me to these. We only have a couple of them we're going to look at. Matthew chapter 17. Look at verse number 24. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 17, verse number 24. Now the system of police, I'm just going to give you my opinion on this subject as well while we're on this. They would be considered a type of government. The system of police is not something that is biblical at all. Not even slightly, not even a little bit. You know, it's, it's not found in Scripture at all. And, and that's what they are referred to as today is police. And what that specifically means is that they are policing. So what they, what they are doing, what their job is to go about and look for things that people are doing wrong. That's not taught in Scripture anywhere. What there are is there are judges that stayed in the city of refuge and in the temple. You know what happened was if you had an issue... You go and you and that person, you go to that judge. And then once there's a problem, then the judge intervenes. But there's not this constant intervention of government in your lives in the Old Testament uh, uh, law. God didn't design there to be people that are just constantly walking around, right? That are constantly seeing whether things are right and whether things are wrong. And they're just policing in every area of your life. You know, the idea of taking personal responsibility or personal accountability that stems or is, or is found is really it's the core of libertarianism comes from and derives from the Bible. The people in our country, and libertarianism is obviously uh, would be a, considered a, an ideology of people that uh, uh, dwell in the United States of America. Where that came from in the first place is the Bible. The Bible teaches the philosophy of libertarianism. It really and truly does. The only reason why I am a libertarian is because the Bible teaches that set, you know, that type of mindset or that type of mentality, if you will, ideology. Now, there's all different types of, you know, libertarians out there. There's libertarians that will go so far as to, you know, anarchy. You know, uh, there are libertarians that, you know, uh, would, would condone of, of just, it, where, where what they believe to be laws don't derive from the Bible and they have just disgusting, you know, morality, where they would be so far as to allow, they would go so far as to allow abortion and to say abortion is all right. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's their rights, right? You know, Obviously, number one, outside, even outside of the Bible, I can argue with this type of person because supposedly they would say that oh, you know, the Constitution is the law of the land and that's what they would always be harping on. But doesn't the Constitution say that each person deserves from God it is their right to life, liberty, and pursuit of, of happiness? Isn't that what the Constitution teaches? And supposedly these people are libertarianisms, libertarians, right? And they believe in libertarianism, but they're, they're saying that, you know, it's that person's right. You know, it's, it's that woman's right to, you know, murder her baby or to kill her baby, right? There isn't a scientist in this world that would look at the baby that is growing in a woman's womb and say that that's not alive. You are an absolute fool and you are not a true libertarian if you try to act like you think that it's a woman's right to murder her baby. You are not even close to a libertarian. You're not even close. You know, you know, here's the thing. Like I said, our views and our ideology starts here. Amen. 
So if, if, you, you know, if you get out there and you look at all of these different views that people have on liberty, and that's obviously where that phrase comes from, or the, the title libertarianism, you know, if it doesn't start here, it's still it's going to be a mess. It doesn't matter whether you're a Republican, whether you're a Democrat, it doesn't matter what you are. If it doesn't start from the Bible, you have to have the morality that the Bible teaches as your foundation. Look at Matthew chapter number 17. Matthew chapter number 17, verse number 24, on the subject of, of tribute and taxes. It says this, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money, and tribute means taxes, came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Those are two words for taxes. Of their own children or of strangers? So are they collecting this of their own children? You know, saying their physical blood? Or of strangers, people that they don't even know? Peter saith unto him, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, he says, go thou to the sea and cast an hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. He says, that take and give unto them for me and thee. Does everybody know what the word notwithstanding means? Never, that's an exact definition of it. It's synonymous with the word nevertheless. So what Jesus is saying is, basically, you know, you shouldn't have to pay taxes. That's in layman's terms. You shouldn't have to pay them. You know, you, 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 if, you're paying, if you're paying money to someone that is not... Uh, uh, I want you to think about this too. This is an interesting concept. The Old Testament. When they paid taxes, were they paying them to their children or to their family? It's interesting, isn't it? So they were paying it to their family. So in that case, would, they, would that still have been considered freedom according to Jesus' judgments? And this is Jesus' philosophy. It would be, right? But in this case, what you have is strangers taking money from strangers, people that they don't know at all, and forcing them to pay. And also on top of that, that taxation in the Old Testament would not have been theft. Because when God asked, when God stood before, Moses stood before on behalf of God's the minister, he spoke before all the people, he read everything, the whole book of the law to them, and you know what everybody said? Amen. You know what that means? We agree with that. Let's do it. So that's not theft, my friend. Theft is stealing from someone. Now this is a totally different situation. They're just forcing them to pay this money. So what he's teaching is, you're not truly free if you're forced to pay money to strangers. But then he goes on and says this, nevertheless, nevertheless, notwithstanding. He says, go and find, you know, get a hook and you know, catch this fish. And obviously, the Lord uh, miraculously uh, uh, had a, a, a uh, piece of money appear in this fish's mouth and then he paid the tax or the tribute with that. But what was Jesus' view? Number one, you know, he believed that this was theft, didn't he? Do you know what Jesus is teaching, really? It's funny, but taxation is theft. That's what Jesus is teaching. He's saying they're being forced to do this. That's what he's teaching, right? Number two, he's teaching, do it anyways. Pay it anyways. Even though it's theft, even though they're taking money from those that are not their own blood, not their own family, you need to just pay it anyways. That's what he's teaching. Go with me now to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter number 22. <clears throat> so even if you're being charged, you know, a, a lodging tax, right? A, you know, your, your, your tax is on your house. Right? Property tax. If you're being charged a sales tax. If you're being charged, you know, a street tax. Whatever the tax may be. You know, I don't know how many taxes there are in the United States. I remember hearing the number a few times. It's insane. It's insane the amount of taxes that we pay in the United States of America. Now, even though, you know, the vast percentage of that is not being paid towards the ministers of God who are, you know, punishing evildoers, you should pay it anyways. Pay all their dues. You should pay it anyways. What's the reason why, Jesus said? Lest we should what? Offend them. Do you know why? Like I said already, we have bigger fish to fry. That's why. Amen. Lest we offend them and they become angry over this. You know what he's saying is? He's got, he's got a job to do. He has a job to do and this is not a fight that he's willing to start right now. 
It's, it's, a, it's a perfect way of how we'll use this type of, uh, we, use the, we use this phrase oftentimes, right? The, a cliche phrase that says, you know, about dying on that hill. And people make the statement, you know, I'm not willing to die on that hill. That's what Jesus is saying. That's really what he's saying. He's saying, this is not the hill that I'm willing to die on. That's what he's saying. Lest we offend them, because what's going to be the result of when they're offended? They're going to come and arrest him. Now, he's going to be arrested later on. But he has a job to do right now. And he's saying he doesn't want to offend them. Why? Because he has priorities. So he's willing to pay this money so that he is able to continue to serve God. That's, his, that's exactly what he's saying. And if, if, you know, in this situation here, our, you know, our church, obviously, it's great that, that, that we are able, you know, to not pay taxes in the state of Florida. You know, we don't pay taxes here. We're not 501c3, but we don't pay taxes in the state of Florida. And I'm happy that they offer that. That's, and people will try to, you know, say, well, well then you guys must be, you know, uh, uh, forced to, you're, you're, what would they call those types of preachers? What do they call them? Can anybody remember? I can't think of it right now. You know what I'm talking about? They'll call those type, the, 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 you know, preachers that are like basically in the government's pocket and they're forcing you. I can tell everybody's racking their brain and nobody remembers it. You know, they're forcing you to preach exactly what they want you to preach and, you know, they're going to make sure that, that you don't get out of line and things like that. I can promise you that that's not the case here. They'll, we'll pay taxes before that happens, my friend. If they started saying, hey, you're not allowed to preach that right then, then I'd say, okay, tell me the percentage, you know, because that's not happening. You know, here's the thing. If, if it comes down to paying the taxes and trimming the message, if it comes down to paying the taxes and serving God, if it comes down to paying the taxes and whatever it may be, we have to sacrifice something on this side spiritually, we'll pay the taxes. Because you know what? Jesus said he was going to pay the taxes. Lest we offend them. Because, like I said, we have bigger fish to fry. I'm not willing to die on the hill you know, of fighting the government. That's not, my, that's not why I'm here. That's not my priority. And if, you, if that's your priority, then you don't have the same priority that Jesus had. Because he wasn't either. That wasn't what he was doing. He went around and he actually tried not to offend those that were serving in the government. Do you know why? So he could preach the gospel to all the people in Israel. Amen. He wanted to go around. He wanted to make sure that he could get the gospel to the people in Israel. And if he had to pay a stupid tax, he paid it. He didn't sit there and fight with them and make them mad and then get arrested and go to jail for five days and then for a wasted five days of time, right? Where he would be able to do that. You know, then at that point, all different times, you never know what could happen if, 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 a, if a, a servant of the Lord decides to do things like that. Oftentimes it causes the flock to scatter. Oftentimes it hurts the things of God. And if they would just follow Christ's example, they would just pay the stupid taxes. Do I like it? No. No one likes paying taxes, okay? No one does. does it, raise your hand if you like paying taxes. Does anyone like paying? Do you enjoy paying taxes? No one does. It's a stupid question. I don't like it just as much as you don't like it. But do you know what? I'm not willing to die on that hill and nor was Jesus. I have bigger fish to fry in my life. Then if the church has to pay taxes, if I have to pay taxes personally, I'm going to make that decision and I'm going to go ahead and pay the taxes. If, if in any way the government puts some sort of obstacle in front of me of some sort of tribute or tax that I have to be obedient to or it's going to impede the work of the Lord, I'm just going to pay it. I'm going to pay it. Well, you know why? Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. That's why. Look at Matthew chapter number 22. Verse number 17, it says this. Tell us therefore what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? So I mean, this is a direct question, isn't it? I mean, he's asking right now, is it right to pay taxes? That's what he's asking. Verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. So somebody got a penny and they brought it to him. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. Now does that sound familiar? Render? You know what it said in Romans chapter number 13? It said, render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute. Uh, what does it say next? Custom to whom custom. Honor to whom honor. It's teaching the exact same thing. Paul is perfectly in line with what the Lord Jesus Christ taught. He said his face is on it. He's issuing this money. Just 
Give him, give him, give pay his pack, tax, stupid tax. Pay his stupid tax. It says this. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. And then he says this. And unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 13. We should pay tribute. Do we like doing it? No. The reason why you should do it is so you don't offend them. 1 Peter chapter number 2. <clears throat> I don't want to do anything that hinders the work of Christ. I don't want to do anything that can, that can... If I can pay the tax, if I can pay the stupid tax without hurting the work of Christ, you would be a fool not to do it. You would be a fool not to do it. Now people try to argue and say, well, you are hurting. The That's dumb. Just paying the money. Just pay, C just pay Caesar what he wants. Just give it to him. You know why? This is what Jesus is saying. Get him out of your hair. He's going to leave you alone. That's what's going to happen. I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. Get Romans chapter number 13 in your other hand as well. Still, let's go to Romans chapter 13. I want to compare a couple of things here. <clears throat> it says, uh, Render therefore unto all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, and then it says, Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. It goes on. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. I want you to look at verse number 13. It says this, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. And now we get an idea of what specifically he's talking about. It says this, Whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. So we can see a lot of overlap from this in uh, Romans chapter number 13 as well. We can, or from Romans 13 to this. See a lot of uh, overlap from Romans 13 to this. One of the things that's mentioned is the punishment of evildoers. That's where that phrase comes from. The punishment of evildoers. That's what's being discussed in Romans 13. But then also here it talks about submitting to every ordinance of man. And it goes, it starts at the top of human government that is. It says, whether it be to the king as supreme. Now who would that be at their time? That'd be Caesar. You know, he was the emperor saying unto Caesar, and then it goes on, or unto governors. Governors would be those that, like governors in our system, it would be state or city, you could even say, right? They're both referred to, a city would be mayor, governors would be state, and then we have pre a president. Now our president is obviously not a king, right? But that's not the point of what this is teaching. The point is just saying every ordinance of man. That's the point. Any ordinance that is passed by man says submit unto it. Now people, again, the, the reason why oftentimes, and I'm not saying there aren't some people that are maybe just confused about this, but the vast majority of the time it's pride that's causing someone to resist this truth. It says this, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. That's not some, that's every. That's submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Now what is an ordinance? Ordinance is a law. Or commandment. Oftentimes ordinance are referring to smaller laws or smaller commandments. It's oftentimes referring to things that keep order. Right? Uh, that's what an ordinance is. It's something again, like that's where that word comes from. Keeping order. That's the purpose of law and of government. I've heard the argument from Romans 13 of, hey, there's this specific scope of government. And if they get outside of that for any reason, you don't have to obey them. I don't believe that for even a second. And I don't think that you can teach that from the Bible. Because you, you not only have Romans 13, uh, Romans 13 to deal with, you also now have 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 13, which clearly tells you to submit yourselves unto every ordinance of man. Every ordinance of man. And then he goes on to specify whether that's the king, whether that's the governor, you know, the, the, those that are, you know, uh, the punishment, they're sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. It's every ordinance of man. Now, what would be examples of this? Now, obviously, you know, we're not going to go around murdering people, right? That's against God's law, which is the supreme of, of all. But even in, in uh, you know, uh, um, relation to that, further than that, let's say, furthermore, what about, you know, and this is something I'm guilty for, speeding, right? Running red lights. 
things like that. I'm sure everybody runs red lights every, every once in a while, right? I try not to run red lights, but I'm terrible about, about speeding. We should obey the laws of the land of every ordinance of man. We should keep every ordinance that is passed in our nation today. Whether that be federal, that's under the king supreme, or whether that be state, that would be like your governor. You could also, you know, throw your mayor in there if he wants to be considered a governor as well. It's saying every, the purpose is this, every ordinance of man. The Bible teaches that you should, admit, you should submit yourselves unto every ordinance of man. That's not just things that would be considered, you know, completely, you know, that they have this small scope here and if they get out of line. No, that would be things also like speeding. These is, if this is an ordinance that they've passed, you need to follow it. If it's, a, if it's a, a law that government has passed, then you should follow it. It's not some, it's every ordinance of man. Keep reading, it says this, or unto governors as unto them, verse 14, that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Watch this. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So here's the thing. What's the purpose of this? What's the, what's the reason why that you would be keeping all of these different ordinances and things like that? What's, what would be the reason for that? Because when you're demonstrating your character, you're demonstrating your obedience. Look at what it says at the very end of that verse. It says this. It says, ye, that ye may put to silence, it says, the ignorance of foolish man. Now watch this, verse 16, as free. What does it mean as free? You know, in, a, in the sense that we serve Christ, we don't have to obey that in that sense. That's what he's saying. As free, right? But look further. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. And then he goes on, and this is all tied together. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. And then he says this. Honor the king. He says, honor the king. Now, who, you know who the king was at that time was who? What did you say? Caesar. It would be Caesar. Now, was Caesar the greatest guy in the world? So what is he saying by specifically honor? What does that mean? It means respect. That's what it means. What do you see Paul doing to every single officer that he encounters every single time? He respects them. Every time. Because we can look at examples and see what this means. Every single officer and official that Paul encounters, doesn't matter who it is, there were Felix, Festus, Roman soldiers, centurions, every time. You know what he does? He honored them. He showed respect unto them. You know what you should do? You should follow Paul's example. Even, even, still, you know, even if you don't want to. Let me just word it in a very simple way. Even if you don't want to do it. I'm sure Paul at times didn't want to. When they're smiting him in the face, do you think he's just loving it? I'm sure he's, you know, all different types of thoughts are crossing his mind. But you know what he did? He just suffered it and he honored them anyways. That's what the Christians of the Bible did. That's what the men of the Bible did. And we're, we're told to honor the king. Now there's a, there is a caveat to this and we're going to get into that right now. I want you to go to Revelation chapter number 13. So some pastors will teach that Romans 13 and that the Bible there is telling us that we should obey all governments, no matter what government it is, in every situation. In every situation and no matter what commandment or law that they give. And they do so by, they, do, they say this by saying that Romans 13 is, is teaching that you should obey all governments at all times, no matter what. And that this, and that you would be disobeying God by disobeying that government. Now, <clears throat> I, I looked this up. This is from the, the Living Bible. I want you to listen to what Romans 13 verse 1 says in the Living Bible. Okay? Obey the government. That's how it starts out in the Living Bible. Romans 13 verse 1. Obey the government, for God is the one who has put it there. There is no government, now listen to this further, there is no government anywhere that God has not placed in power. Now, Romans 13 does not say that even close. 
So there is no government anywhere that God has not placed in power. That's what Romans 13 uh, verse 1 says. Then it says this, So those who refuse to obey the laws of the land are refusing to obey God. And then it says, And punishment will follow. So, first they say, you know, God, obey government. And then it goes on to say, because God put it there. And then they say this, There is no government anywhere, anywhere, that exists, ever, is what it's teaching, right? Anywhere, ever, that's what it's saying. There is no government anywhere that God did not put into power. And it says, so you better obey it, because if you disobey that government, then you would be disobeying God. I want you to look with me at Revelation chapter number 13. Revelation chapter number 13. It says this in verse number 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, notice this, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So who is the dragon? That's Satan. That's not God. That's not, you know, the Lord. That's the devil. The dragon is Satan. That's the devil. And it says that the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Well, Romans 13 verse 1 in the Living Bible said that there is no government anywhere that God has not, that God did not put into power. Now, doesn't this contradict majorly, like in an extreme way? They're saying that every government that exists, God put them there. They're there because God put them there. Revelation chapter number 13 plainly teaches that the devil is the one who put the beast. And the beast is the Antichrist. This is the, the, the king of the new world order. He's ruling over the system of government in the end times over the entire world. And the Bible teaches that Satan is the one that put this man in charge. Not God. That is not God's will for him to reign and rule and, and, to, and to work wickedness. Right? I want you to turn with me now. The last place I want you to turn with me. You go ahead and go and I'm going to read you from another place. Go to Acts chapter number 5. Acts chapter number 5. Hosea chapter number 8 verse number 4 says this. To further prove this point. It says, They, ha they have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. So it says that they have set up kings. This is God speaking, but not by me. What he means by that is it wasn't his will. He wasn't the one that did it. He wasn't the one that set this government up. So we can see in Romans 13 in the Living Bible, they're trying to teach that every single government anywhere, any, they're not saying just the system of government. They're saying that every government over every nation, that specific government, the officials that are in each office and the people that have this power are there because God put them there. Now, this stems from a Calvinistic type of mentality. That's what it comes from. That God just is, he's just literally controlling every single molecule in the world and no one has free will and God does everything. He plugs people into this position, he does this, everybody's just his robot and has strings on them that's being pulled and they're just doing his will. Well, you have a major problem when the Bible tells you that the devil's the one that put the Antichrist into power. So that right there proves that and then also Hosea 8 shows and teaches us that they, there are rulers that are in power and God didn't want them to be there. That it's not God's will that they would be in power and that they would be ruling and reigning in this particular area. Now, I find it interesting a couple of things if you think of it from this perspective. You know, who is behind the corruption of God's Word? All of these mass versions, who is it? It's the devil that's the one that's, that's doing this, right? Yea, hath God said. We're not ignorant of his devices. That's what he always does, is attack God's Word, always. So, Satan is the one that is behind changing and corrupting God's Word, right? Well, I want you to think about this as well. If Satan is the one corrupting God's Word, Satan is the one that had Romans 13 in the living. This obviously isn't God's Word in the living Bible, is it? Romans 13 in the living Bible? It's not at all. 
So he is the one working through these evil men, and he's the one that makes this change. And it's a very strategic change that teaches that every government everywhere should be obeyed. Every single government everywhere should be obeyed. And then it goes further and it says that if you, if you disobey that government, you are disobeying God. Now, if you just, as a Christian, took that at face value, what would you do when the Antichrist showed up? What would you do? You'd take the mark. Exactly. You would take the mark. You would obey, wouldn't you? You'd do whatever he wanted you to do. You'd take the mark of the beast and you would follow every commandment or, you, or you'd be thinking in your mind, I'm going to disobey God, wouldn't you? Who is it that's going to be in power? And who is it that gave him his seat and his authority? Satan. So does it make perfect sense why Satan would be changing these particular... You know what he's doing is he's conditioning people. He's conditioned... There are, there are millions of people that have read Romans 13 that claim to be Christians that have read Romans chapter number 13, verse number 1 in the Living Bible. And they walked away thinking, I need to obey. And there are plenty of preachers that I've heard say this over and over again. You need to obey any government and every commandment that, and law that is ever passed by any government anywhere. You know, to the point of, you know, you know, if you were in, you know, if, if Stalin was reigning over you, you should have been obedient to Stalin and Adolf Hitler and Mao Zedong and all of these dictators and, 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 and murderers that you should have been following them and, and obeying them. If that was your job from God, right? There are people that actually teach that and believe that. But going back to, and this is going to be a perfect conclusion because I want to keep this on your mind in the beginning of each sermon. It's great to end it at the end of each sermon. There's a totem pole. There's a totem pole and there's a hierarchy and there's a structure and at the very top of that authority structure is God. Amen. And I'll tell you the time when you don't obey an ordinance of man. I'll tell you a time when it's alright to disobey man. It's when you have to, by obeying man, disobey God. When you disobey a commandment, if, let's say, let's word it this way. If you were to have to you know, uh, uh, let's say, let's, I'll even give you an illustration. Let's say 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there's a law passed in the United States of America that says, by our government, that says, the, you know, the King James Bible in particular is a hate book. You know, it's, it's, it's propagating hate. It's intolerant. It doesn't, you know, at this point, since they say we're a democracy, which we were not founded to be a democracy, since we're a democracy and now the majority of people would, don't use the King James Bible anymore and the majority would, you know, uh, uh, the word sodomite is out of our language and they would be against a lot of the things that it propagates, we are going to ban the King James Bible in the United States of America. What do you think you should do? Go hand in your King James Bible? Of course not. Not a chance. What if they said, hey, <clears throat> no prayer. Not allowed to pray anymore. You're not allowed to pray to your God. You know, you're only allowed to pray to, you know, you know a, a, a universal God. You know, you want to pray, you can pray, but it's got to be a universal God. It's got to be a God that includes Muslims. You know, he's got to be a God that loves homosexuals. You know, you know just some, some, some type of crazy type of ordinance or law. Should we obey that? What's the reason why? Be exactly. Because there's a Lord of those lords. And there's a, they may forget about it. They may try to, they may try to you know, wipe him off the map and try to you know, be our, our God. They may try to do that in areas, right? But it doesn't matter. There's still a God of gods. And there's a Lord of lords. And at the top of the totem pole is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to obey His commandments in those, in those areas. When they come up with some, you know, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that, and it conflicts with the Lord's law, that is an ordinance that we do not obey. We can see Christians doing this from, you know, all the way back into the Old Testament. You see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, we're not bowing. You see Daniel. I don't care if you tell me I'm not allowed to pray. It says that he, he prayed just as he did before. Right? This is the attitude of a Christian. What are we told that the, at, in the end times that the Christians do when there's the world government? What do they do? 
They're, they're, they're disobeying and they're running from the persecution, aren't they? And, they're, and they are disobeying the, the beast. Acts chapter number 5, verse number 29, we'll end here. The Bible says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God rather than men. So here's the thing. I want to end on this point. I'm going to give you a couple of, of recaps real fast and we're going to be finished. So, government, human government, societal government, political government, whatever you want to refer to it as, is legitimate from God's view. What is the purpose of that government? The purpose of that government is to punish evildoers. Taxation, from God's perspective, is legit when it is supporting those evildoers because that's the only purpose of government. That's the only type, the only area of government that should exist in the, per, in the first place. So it would be legitimate if our only tax was to support those, those punisher, the, the rulers, let's say, because they're referred to as rulers, or ministers of God that are punishing evildoers. That would be legitimate. Should we pay other taxes? Yes, we should. Just because they're not justified doesn't mean that we shouldn't pay them. We should pay them. And why? So that we can continue doing here at Valiant Baptist Church the work of the Lord. So that we don't offend them. Lest we should offend them. We should. Now what about the ordinances of man? Any other commandments and laws that they come up with? You should keep them. All of them. As long as they do not cause you to disobey God. Always 100% keep in mind that... What, this is what needs to be recognized and acknowledged and, has, and have precedence. The Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. In all situations, Amen. He always is at the top and He always takes priority in any sort of government. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank You, dear Lord, for this night. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the clear teachings of Your Word when it comes to every area of life and how we should believe. And it's so consistent, makes perfect sense. It's logical in every single area. Everything that man comes up with on his own is just, just, just confusing and disjointed and makes no sense at all. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for giving it to us, for preserving it for us, dear Lord. We ask You that You would help us to be obedient to it to un and, and that You would open up our understanding more and more each day and create in us a zeal and a love for Your Word and help us to, to have the desire to teach it to others and also help us to be a soul-winning uh, powerhouse here at Jacksonville, in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, we ask You that You would bless our church in every area and help us to grow as well. And we love You and in Jesus Christ's name, Amen. Amen.